Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, uh, I've been here for quite a while. And uh, this presentation is, owes a lot of thanks to a number of people, um, especially research students and postdocs, and uh, um, my sort of mentor, in a way, Judith Milledge, who amassed a collection of diamonds which are present at UCL, which enable us to study uh, natural diamonds. <coughs> and uh, Judith Milledge was herself, um, has an excellent pedigree, if you like, from uh, Kathleen Lonsdale. And uh, Diamond has a long history of involvement at UCL. So um, Kathleen Lonsdale was, uh, has many accolades, first female professor at UCL and uh, first female member of the Royal Society. And uh, Judith Millage um, started work here on Diamonds um, at around 1950. Um, and uh, just a slide is just to show the sort of diamonds we're more interested in, not the shiny ones on the left. Um, we're much more interested in uh, diamonds with inclusions in, so you can see the red garnet inclusion in the diamond at the top. Um, and that usually means that the diamonds we deal with are um, less spectacular, um, though the same material. And uh, if they're grubby and have got inclusions in or dark, um, we, we do quite well from the pieces which the diamond industry discard. So uh, we look at the um, inclusion-rich uh, parts of the diamonds in particular. <coughs> I've been involved with looking at the origin of carbon-rich uh, magmas and how they deliver materials from the Earth's mantle to the crust through time. And uh, this has led me to perform experiments to see how those systems operate, both the crystals and the melts. And it seemed natural, therefore, to look at um, the carbon cycle coming from the deep Earth to the Earth's surface. And so diamond is a logical uh, material to pursue. Um, <coughs> so my background is in high pressure high-pressure experiments um, and looking at minerals which have come from high pressures. So by way of introduction, it's, it wasn't until 1950s that um, uh, diamond was grown um, and confirmed to be grown under high pressure, high temperature conditions, although there were some uh, earlier experiments in the previous century which reported to have made diamonds uh, by high pressure and high temperature. And uh, there's some fascinating stories attached to whether or not those Hane diamonds were legitimate or they were salted as being natural diamonds put into the experiments to make it look as if they'd been created at high pressure and high temperature. That bait still isn't quite resolved. Um, but um, part of the story is based around um, the experiments at high pressure and high temperature are inherently very dangerous. And um, Hane himself didn't actually conduct the experiments. He uh, had a manservant to, or two to a technician to actually perform the experiments, and uh, they were um, life-threatening experiments because the equipment used to explode quite regularly. And um, after some time, I think it was more than a year or so, um, the, uh, it, it became clear that you know, going to higher pressure and higher temperature was even more dangerous. So at that time, miraculously, um, they produced diamonds, and it may be the case that they were actually salted by the people doing the experiments in order to preserve themselves. So this, this is, this is um, one uh, possible explanation for some of the diamonds being attributed to Hane have unmistakable characteristics of natural diamonds rather than synthetic diamonds. <coughs> so, but since 1950s, it's been available. Uh, a growth of diamond uh, was uh, performed at high pressure and high temperature using metals as the melt, um, a melt catalyst at very high pressure and temperature on the basis that meteorites were seen to have uh, iron nickel metal in, and they also had diamonds. And so the same method was used uh, to produce diamonds commercially, effectively, and has been since that time. There are other methods of producing diamonds, including uh, explosive detonation. Um, this is <coughs> based around, uh, uh, or developed by um, a gentleman called Paul De Carli. I've got a picture of him later on. And uh, his particular method was also dangerous and generally led to people losing their hearing, from what I can see, from the people who actually still are involved in that part. And then more recently, we've had chemical vapor deposition, which is the direct uh, deposition of diamond um, out of its stability field. So this is the only method on here which isn't high pressure and high temperature. In fact, it takes place at high temperature, but at very low pressure from an organic gas. And uh, we'll see a little bit of that later on, too. Um, all the methods which uh, you can make diamond with produce what I would call synthetic diamond, and they differ from natural diamond in some ways, not in their major material property, um, but they do differ in the way that the nitrogen impurities in particular are um, accommodated in the diamond lattice. 
and also in terms of the diff they, have, they don't have the mineral inclusions which you can see in natural diamonds um, which can sometimes be very colourful, red and green colours for example. So <clears throat> the outline of this talk is, is going to cover um, a very wide spectrum of ages when in fact the age of everything and the origin of everything. So starting off with the Big Bang and uh, you'll see this slide pop up from time to time and uh, red colour zones go through so you can get an indication of the pace of the lecture. Uh, so you can see what's coming as well. And um, we start off with uh, the origin of the dim of diamond in the universe. And uh, you know, one would have to say that um, carbon is a very abundant element in the, in the universe, in our solar system in particular. Um, fourth abundance, in however you measure it, fourth in terms of abundance of elements in the periodic table. Um, but, and, and if you look at meteoritic material, which is our samples of uh, old things going back as far as we can in time that we can get our hands on, um, the vast majority of all meteorites contain diamond in one form or another, usually nano-diamond, and uh, so it's incredibly fine-grained, um, dust grain size. So um, I, I, I like this slide as a starting point because it shows um, all matter and all time in one slide. And... Um, I actually tried to draw this myself, but I never come up with the concept until I, somebody at NASA drew it for me, effectively, and I borrowed their slide. Um, Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe is looking backwards towards the furthest distance in time and has been um, involved in making some headlines quite recently. Um, so you start off on the left-hand side with uh, the origin of everything, which you might call the Big Bang, and you might decide that's more than one event or a single event, depending on what you make of the Horizon program recently, for example. And you can count the, uh, the girdles going left to right in one billion year time steps. So if you start at this end, this is current day, and that is 13.7 billion years ago, the origin of everything. So if we count back 4.6 billion years, around this point in time is the formation of our solar system. <coughs> and uh, this is an example of... Um, what we see, if you are able to image um, nanodiamonds in um, chondritic meteorites, for example, so this scale bar on the bottom left-hand part here is 5 by 1 nanometers, and you can pick out um, some crystalline structures. The bright spots in here effectively are um, locations of um, diamond-like structures in what can be retrieved as nanodiamond. Uh, the Open University have become masters at collecting nanodiamonds from meteorites. It took them... I think more than 10 years before they could actually analyze them properly. And um, I was told, um, I don't think totally flippantly, but uh, they realized the first nine years they'd been filtering everything and then eventually throwing the last part down the sink. So it was very, you couldn't actually realize where the, where the nano diamond was re residing when you dissolve everything else in your sample. So basically you just use acid digestion. But now they're able to subdivide nano diamonds into different types. <coughs> So we start off with um, early formation of uh, dust, and uh, we're not quite sure how that happens, but diamond is, is associated with the earliest products that we have record for. And um, on the right-hand side here is a phase diagram, so pressure going across to the right and temperature going up vertically in thousands of degrees, and pressure across here in gigapascals, 10, 20 gigapascals. If you went further to the right, the core mantle boundary, which is sort of halfway into the Earth, if you like, would be at 135 gigapascals pressure, just to give you an idea. And uh, I've put some other, uh, well, actually another slide, sorry. <laughs> um, th so th this shows the stability field for um, uh, diamond, here labeled as cubic diamond, and then graphite on the left-hand side. So the conversion from graphite to diamond uh, it follows this um, nearly straight line, which is inclined as a function of pressure and temperature, and was first derived by um, a scientist called Bundy. And uh, so this line here is the reaction or stability curve between graphite and diamond. Materials which are any form of carbon should be should crystallized as diamond on the right of that line and form graphite on the left of that line. If you then know that the, um, the geotherm in the Earth, which is the increase in temperature with pressure as you go down in the Earth, follows this curve, <coughs> you'll realize that um, the vast majority of that sits in the diamond field. So you cannot make graphite stable inside the Earth because it's too... Um, too high a pressure for the given temperature. Uh, the only part of this diagram which is possibly wrong um, is this curve here between diamond and liquid, which gives the impression that if you go towards the core mantle boundary, um, carbon-based materials like diamond would become a liquid at the core mantle boundary. Um, that curve actually goes the other way, 
um, so that as you go towards the, is now thought to go the other way, uh, theoretically, so that um, diamond actually becomes more stable as you go to the right in this diagram for any temperature rather than getting less stable. And what this diagram effectively shows is, and what we know, is that the diamond itself would be stable to pressures more than twice the pressure and temperature at the centre of the Earth, uh, which is, uh, means that once you effectively have made diamond, it's very difficult to get rid of it. Um, so even a planetary interplanetary collision between two planets of bodies the size of the Earth, you might cause all the silicate material on the outside to remelt, but you could not actually get rid of the diamond that was there previously. <coughs> so that's my basis for understanding diamond as a, and its stability. If you, uh, this diagram contains a lot of information. I'm sorry, it's, it's, but it, it's, it, it, you can look at it at several different levels. Here's an image of the diamond structure. You'll see that crop up on another side. Um, on the bottom, you'll see a familiar form of diamond. Of course, you'd all like to have one that size. Um, and then on the bottom uh, right-hand side, we've got just an illustration showing a similar diagram. Actually, these are smaller ones. Uh, similar diamonds, but just showing their array of colors. So this is just their physical uh, characteristic, their optical properties. Um, the two blue uh, diamonds here have been uh, sectioned, um, which in itself is challenging because you have to go to some lengths to polish diamond to a flat face. Um, and uh, they are il illuminated under a cathode luminescence. And uh, this particular technique is very powerful for showing textures inside diamond, um, which in ordinary light would be completely transparent or not visible. And it's a non-destructive technique, so you can apply it to the exterior of stones and still see these, these, these uh, textures, which look more or less like growth rings on a, in a tree. And uh, that is more or less how they're interpreted. So um, this... Uh, these concentric zones here echo the, uh, the shapes or the crystal growth faces of diamond, um, which is showing an octahedral um, uh, symmetry here in the centre, and then the exterior of the diamond is more rounded. But you'll also notice that the different shades of blue, there are some high spots which are uh, brighter, um, and then the shades of blue themselves generally correspond to different intensities or different contents of nitrogen in the diamond. So diamonds are actually uh, close to being a pure material, but they contain naturally nitrogen within them as well. And they're classified into two main types of material. They're classified into uh, diamond with measurable nitrogen, which means more than effectively about 80 to 100 parts per million, and that goes up to about two to 3,000 parts per million, occasionally more. Or they're classified as diamonds without detectable nitrogen, which actually doesn't mean they haven't got any, it just means that we can't detect it. So those are diamonds with sub-80 parts per million uh, nitrogen. Um, so we can start away, straight away by saying that you know, diamond is um, almost all carbon, but there is a little bit of other material in it as well. And some of these colours are generated by um, occasional impurities or um, strain and other features too. But a, one or two of the colours can be generated by very small amounts of other impurities. Uh, the image on the left here is um, a black and white image um, of a catholuminescence generated uh, view. So here we're seeing a cubic shape, more of a diamond. And uh, the bottom left-hand uh, image here is a very, very strange uh, black diamond called Carbonado, which we'll return to briefly at the end. Um, which has got a, a melted surface, to all intents and purposes, and um, unknown origin. <coughs> um, both the carbon and the nitrogen in diamond has uh, specific isotopic characteristics. You know, both of those elements have got isotopes. Carbon's got stable and radiogenic. But if you just look at the stable isotopes, um, on here is the 13 to 12 carbon isotope ratio for diamond. Uh, or for any material, this, this is comparing um, the locus of points for um, ensotite chondrites, in fact, with some mantle diamonds. The mantle diamonds occupy the, uh, the histogram uh, blocky sort of tower shapes, and the dots encompass the range, which is known from, as you can see, uh, hundreds of ensotite chondrite meteorites, which have now been measured. And you can do the same for nitrogen. This is the 14-14 nitrogen isotopic ratio, uh, ratio to some other material, um, so we get this strange per mil notation. And um, the terrestrial value 
for nitrogen in the mantle lies a little bit to the right. I think you can see that even for the diamond, compared with the peak for chondritic meteorites. So they don't quite match up, but they're not a long way off. So to a first approximation, you could actually say that diamond is made from carbon and nitrogen, which are both more or less identical to what you can find in meteorites. <coughs> and uh, the last, this last part of showing the nitrogen story is that uh, because diamonds are transparent, you can use spectroscopy very efficiently to look at uh, vibrations in the lattice of the diamond and understand what other components there are in diamond apart from just carbon. And if you use infrared spectroscopy, you can uh, look in this region. These, are, uh, th these peaks here are for um, different types of nitrogen um, in the diamond structure. This is a diamond uh, response, self-absorption, if you like. And these peaks are very rarely seen, but they're put on here to indicate where they would occur. These are two peaks for hydrogen or water in the diamond structure, too, which you can also find. Um, not common, but uh, definitely uh, occurs in some diamonds. So we can use these features, the shapes of these uh, peaks and their uh, widths um, can either be totally absent. If you've got a type a diamond which has no nitrogen in it at all, then these peaks will be simply completely absent. And obviously the height of the peak increases with the proportion of nitrogen that's in the diamond. So you can use those peaks to tell you not only how much nitrogen is there, but also um, what state it's in inside the diamond structure. <clears throat> if we turn to um, some synthetic diamonds, um, the little code down here is to show we're producing exactly the same material. It has the same hardness, the same physical properties as natural diamond. Um, but um, when you look at them, they have uh, uh, often got a yellowish color. Um, this, this is um, one particular uh, type of synthetic diamond. Uh, the diamond's made in, in, in association with metal melts. Um, they, they can even have uh, enough iron or nickel in them that you can attract them with a magnet, so you can be quite sure they're not normal natural diamond. Um, <coughs> uh, the yellowish color um, is, is dominant as well. And uh, we, we uh, spend our time, I should say, at UCL not trying to grow diamonds to sell. Um, you know, perhaps that might change in the future. <laughs> but but, but um, uh, we actually just are interested in the conditions under which they can grow. So for us, normally what we start with is more like the image on the, uh, the right-hand side here. Uh, this is a sequence um, showing uh, material which is firstly prepared as a flat substrate. It's then um, introduced to some experimental condition, and what we look for are um, precipitate growths on that surface to give us an indication that we've entered the stable phase for precipitation of diamond, for example, as opposed to whatever was in the starting material. In this case, it was graphite in some mixture. So th these are experiments conducted at pressures of uh, 5 to 10 gigapascals and uh, about 1,500 degrees centigrade, typically. And you can grow diamond from a lot of things, and you can grow it very fast. So in our experiments, up to 20 gigapascals pressure, um, we can produce these sorts of textures in seconds, in fact. Um, diamond growth is extraordinarily fast, as soon as you get the right conditions. So this, this gives us a little bit of a conundrum, because how do we then compare our very rapid growth in laboratory with what must take a very long period of time, perhaps, in natural systems. <coughs> so here we are growing diamond in the laboratory then, focusing on that part. And just, just to recap the, uh, the three methods which I very briefly touched on at the start, which can grow diamonds. Um, the high pressure, high temperature form is the dominant form which, is you, which we think uh, a diamond has grown in in nature. Um, there are just some ideas on the left here to try and get your thinking about what the equivalence in pressure is. Most people are familiar with temperature, because, you know, that's the thing you encounter every day, but they're not so familiar with pressure. And uh, pressure is actually nothing at, at all extraordinary. It's just a condition you apply to your sample, from my point of view. Um, but, yes, it does, you do have to be careful. Um, usually in our situations, unloading is dangerous, loading is dangerous. So um, um, here's some equivalents to, you know, to think about. Something like 150 kilometers uh, vertical pile of rock sitting on one, on your, on, you know, area for area would give you the same equivalent pressure. Um, and we have to contain this usually in a volume of about one millimeter cubed um, for a few hours. So, in fact, this is actually relatively straightforward to do. Um, focusing your pressure using the stiletto heel approach, um, we use uh, an assembly um, of uh, anvils, 
called, made of tungsten carbide, which is very hard. And then our um, experimental materials in the center, it has electrical leads leading in and out, and there are ceramics in here, which act as insulators, uh, and also then a, 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 a furnace inside the whole pressure structure, uh, a tiny furnace inside, again, which is your sample. And the pressure is applied by just a very large uniaxial press on the outside. So that, that, in, that in one form or another, is how um, we can grow diamond in the laboratory by high pressure, high temperature synthesis, and it replicates um, to a first order how we think diamond has grown in nature. A lot of synthetic diamond uses a catalyst which we don't think happens in nature, metals. But, um, and and the, there are details that are different between the nitrogen isotopes, but uh, the nitrogen bonding, sorry, in the diamond. Um, <coughs> this, the, the other method which I mentioned by Paul de Carly. Paul de Carly is an um, elderly gentleman now, been involved a lot of his life with uh, um, verification of nuclear test bans, and uh, lots of his work was um, not published um, because it was uh, uh, obviously uh, secret. <laughs> Um, in the USA, um, but um, during that time he actually um, did a lot of work on um, problems of scientific interest and uh, his method of uh, uh, producing diamond is uh, very widely um, recognized. And um, you can produce, there's a TEM image again, the little black and white image here is a 10 nanometer scale bar showing a, a, a cluster of um, uh, nanodiamonds produced by, um, either by um, uh, shock in a, this is a very small diagram of a very large piece of apparatus which is similar to a battleship gun, simply fires a projectile at a target um, it gives you a shock wave that way, um, but Paul also used a lot of um, uh, yeah, massive explosives ranging up to nuclear detonations let's say um, which um, were able to produce conditions which aren't going to be copied in a short space of time. So. Um, but the, 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 the detonation method simply relies on uh, um, applying shock in the explosion to graphite and the direct conversion of graphite to diamond. Um, the, um, the difference in um, thermal conductivity between diamond and graphite means that um, you, you are limited in size to uh, effectively what size product you can make. So you can only make fine material. Uh, chemical vapor deposition um, is, a, is a now widely used um, certainly a laboratory technique, to grow diamond uh, surfaces. You can precipitate them on to other material surfaces as coatings. Um, and obviously the, the critical interface, the bonding, or the nature of how they attach, is where a lot of, ex a lot of energy goes. Um, but you can also, if you keep precipitating the diamond um, from uh, vapor, and there's a little um, schematic here, which is a, a, it, it describes... Um, it precipitating as a condensate, like frost on a car windshield, where it's not quite the same. Um, there's a lot of uh, much higher temperature involved and some control of the organic gas that goes in. But the organic gas um, containing carbon is the source of carbon which is deposited as diamond, um, completely out of its stability field. So this is a low pressure phenomenon. Um, you can produce, uh, here sh show some uh, circular plates of a diamond up to a few centimeters across, but only a few uh, millimeters in thickness. Um, and uh, if you keep using the same technique, and actually sometimes it have to be reground in between to remove uh, defects, uh, but you can gradually produce um, larger um, diamonds, so it is possible to get, if you like, some flattish shape of uh, synthetic diamond grown by this method, which have got more three-dimensional shape. Um, <coughs> And we think they're a natural environment, nat natural examples of um, all three of these um, uh, ways of growing diamond. So the last part here is just now to show you some uh, examples of the diamond research we've been doing <coughs> at University College London for the last mm, 10 years or so. <coughs> um, yes, these, the, the picture I showed you before were of um, a serious growing diamond in the presence of... Um, Hydrous fluids, in fact, um, hydrous alkaline fluids, so sodium or potassium rich, um, often carbonate bearing fluids, but certainly with a lot of water in the system. Um, doesn't mention here, but the experiments themselves, these, these are returning to the uh, slightly more dangerous uh, enterprise, because uh, once you have volatile material, then you have to be quite careful how you load your sample and heat it, or um, you generate gas, which isn't desirable. Um, so um, 
here we're looking at some, you know, plotting on here the conditions under which we were successful in growing diamond and comparing that with the uh, standard, if you like, graphite diamond curve. And our objective was to try and see if we could move the temperature bar down. So if you look at the temperature scale, um, these are growing at temperatures below um, 1,200 degrees, um, probably close to about 1,000 degrees. We still have growth of diamond. As you get to lower temperatures, um, even lower than this, uh, if diamond grows, it then becomes sluggish through kinetics, so you can't really see it that well. Other things we've been looking at are um, quantifying the um, optical birefringence of diamond. Uh, if you know the thickness of your diamond you're looking through, it's possible to um, interpret directly the stored strain energy in the diamond and uh, use this to recalculate conditions under which you would return that to zero strain. And this is kind of like reverse, reversing the uh, story for um, the strain around inclusions which we do see in diamonds to tell us where the diamonds have come from, what pressure and temperature they may have originated from. So this is a useful technique. You can use it to look at impurities or damage in materials, but we're actually trying to use it to, to tr retrace the paths of individual diamonds coming to the surface. Um, this, this slide was, uh, is a little bit too busy. I apologize for that. So actually all it's really saying is the top, is the top uh, line that we're looking at the isotope behavior of um, carbon isotopes in particular um, during the growth of diamond and how it partitions between um, the diamond which is grown and the carbon isotopes of the parent material. And um, this was a bit of a surprise to us, really, that we were able to produce an effect that was measurable because we were thinking that actually at high pressure and temperature, fractionation of stable isotopes would be negligible to zero. Um, so it wasn't with the greatest enthusiasm we started the experiments, but to our surprise, we were able to find that uh, we can actually invoke uh, quite a significant change in stable isotope. Uh, deposition of diamonds so it can come out with a different stable isotope signature than the starting material and uh, we're currently in the process of quantifying that. Natural diamonds, perhaps this line is useful. Um, whoops, <laughs> go back one, sorry. I think a couple more slides to go. Natural diamonds do show a range of um, 13 to 12 carbon isotopes and uh, these have been um, used to invoke one origin of quite a lot of diamonds as being the result of diamond formed from subducted organic carbon. So that, um, if you like, even some very old diamond appears to have a record of um, life, which has been converted back to inorganic carbon in the form of the stable isotope signature. Uh, this this, um, this has uh, been uh, a widely held view for the last probably um, 15 or 20 years. Um, however, our experiments are now actually casting doubt on whether this process is really viable in the light of the fact that we're able to reproduce the same sort of isotopic shift without any life in our system. So it doesn't really rule it out, but it gives an, an easier alternative in the middle of the mantle, for example, where you wouldn't really expect much life to be uh, existing. Um, diamond anvil cells, just an example. The bottom right-hand one, is, I think this is the very first diamond anvil cell. If you put the, the pointed ends of diamonds together, because diamond is so strong, uh, they've nonetheless got a very tiny flat surface. Um, you can generate extraordinarily high pressures. And uh, this, there are two diamonds in here. This is simply a cantilever with a screw device on the end so that the force on here is magnified onto the diamonds here. All the forces apply on the diamonds. And uh, this is currently the way of generating statically the highest pressure that we can for any material. In fact, you can get to more than the pressure of the center of the Earth. Um, the trick, if you want to get temperature as well, is that you have to then fire a laser through here to um, supply the heat. But um, it's an extremely useful method. So uh, this is a, a use of diamond rather than actually looking at diamonds themselves. <coughs> and uh, just to show some uh, impact diamond here from uh, possibly a meteorite impact such as this. Actually, the source wasn't known, but uh, it's possible to find um, nanodiamonds and fabrics in nanodiamonds that are very similar to the uh, shock synthesized diamond. So, you know, we know this diamond on the left-hand side is made by shock in the laboratory or in one of those guns or an explosive event. And we know this uh, nanodiamond here um, came from a boundary layer which is thought to have been formed by meteorite impact. So there seems to be a fairly good tie-up that natural diamond can include also impact diamond. <coughs> 
very two more two more to slow, I think, nearly there. Um, so some of the general questions we are trying to answer, um, you know, uh, the, these are questions we haven't got an answer for yet. But um, diamonds are unique in that because of their great age, they have seen a lot of events on the Earth. We think some of them have actually been um, erupted and subducted and come around more than once. Um, so, you know, so that takes two or three hundred million years for each cycle, which is quite extraordinary. Um, but we're hoping to use things like uh, trace uh, noble gases, which are contained within some diamonds. Um, most diamonds that we look at from the mantle come from only one or two hundred kilometers depth. A few seem to have come from maybe five times that. And so we're particularly interested in those, having sampled very deep parts of the Earth's interior. And um, many of these questions are um, speculative but some of them now more directed, so that the last question on here, how much carbon is in the Earth, is something which we stand a reasonable chance of uh, addressing because we can do some uh, mass balance with the carbon isotope story in diamonds. So I think this is the last um, illustrative slide. Um, just to show you, in, in some of this carbonado, the black diamond material, we have um, delicate forms of nitrides in uh, holes, if you like, in the diamond, which have never been, these, these particular minerals have not been seen on the Earth. And uh, they, uh, there are two or three specific minerals in this group, which are uh, forms of uh, copper, silver-bearing titanium nitrides. They're not quite the same as titanium nitride, which is known for meteorites, which is called osbornite. Um, but they are um, in themselves worthy of more study, and that's planned. And they, the group of carbonados, um, just to show you, not all carbonados look the same. So those two materials are both called carbonado. One looks like a sintered piece of um, grey road tarmac or something, I don't know, and the other ones have um, um, got a melted surface on the outside. So actually carbonados um, are not well known. I think I should start with that. And um, probably what we're looking at here is a, is a subgroup of carbonado that is in itself extremely rare. Um, so th this has been conjectured, these group of materials have been conjectured to come from uh, supernova events as being extraterrestrial or from breakup therefore of an asteroid. And uh, there are lots of arguments you can read why that may or may not be true. And I've put the counter-arguments on here that um, others think they're entirely terrestrial. So um, the jury's out on those, but that's some of the most interesting materials. So finally, the conclusions. Um, I hope I've shown you quite a few um, different views of diamond and uh, that it's got a lot of potential for study still in the future. Um, some of the major conclusions are once made, it's very hard to destroy. Um, of course, you can react it with oxygen quite readily. It burns as a rather expensive fuel if you want to go that way. But um, even in planetary collisions, therefore, it's very, very difficult to uh, get rid of diamonds. So there is genuinely the prospect that some diamond may be older than the Earth. <coughs> and uh, because it's so old, um, it may record significant ancient events, such as perhaps the evolution of uh, atmospheres. And uh, we're hoping in some combination of noble gases and looking at the nitrogen, um, there might still be trapped within diamonds some information related to the formation of the Earth's atmosphere, for example. Okay, that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim, for a fascinating talk there. Does, we do have a few minutes if anyone has any brief questions. Um, if you do have a question, please wait for one of our roving microphones to reach you because this lecture is being streamed for the internet and people on the internet won't be able to hear you without a mic. So does anyone have a, a question? Right down here in front. There's a microphone behind you. Thank you. Uh, I wondered about coloured diamonds. You showed us yes. some. Are yes. there other colours, and how would they achieve those colours? In uh, natural diamonds, um, there's a fairly restricted range of colours. Um, pinks are abundant, really. Yellows are abundant. So browns and pinks and yellows. Um, blue is rare. And uh, bottle green, there are two of. So, um, you know, some colours you can find, some are exceedingly rare. Um, it's possible to synthesise diamond even to about one carat size now and introduce colours um, which are generally, gen generally pastel shades. And those pastel shades have each attracted a, you know, a, a sales name associated with it. Um, and so long as uh, synthetic diamonds are recorded a synthetic diamond, then uh, there's no conflict with the natural diamond business, if you like. Um, but yeah, natural diamonds, they, the, some of the green ones, you can find coats of uh, diamond, which they've got an exterior surface which is green, and inside they're completely colourless. Um, but the green on the outside has the effect of making the whole stone look green, and that's usually due to radiation damage. So you go a bit greenish. 
Thank you. There's one in the middle here, Louisa. Thanks. Hi. Um, I wanted to know whether there are materials as hard or harder than diamonds and if they have uh, a similar structure. Oh, good question. <laughs> um, uh, diamond itself has uh, hardness 10 on the hardness scale, but there are some orientations of diamond which are slightly harder. So that, you know, this is one way that you can actually polish diamond with diamond itself if you know the preferred orientation of your material. So it goes up to about 10.1, strictly speaking. Um, there are uh, natural, uh, well, fairly recently, nat there are some natural materials which are harder than diamond, and they're also carbon-based. And they've been described, um, I think, in some impact materials by um, a German uh, scientist called El Gerezi. Well, I'm not sure if he's German, he's working in Germany. Um, so I can give you that information if you want. It's a natural material. We haven't yet, to my knowledge, synthesized anything that's harder than diamond. Uh, you can have composite material which behaves harder than single crystal diamond, um, simply because it doesn't have, you know, natural diamond has a cleavage, so that um, commercially, most diamond which you find is polished on all surfaces except one. One little surface is broken because it's too hard to polish. So that's the risky part of the diamond gem business, really. Um, Are synthesized so diamonds as hard as natural diamonds? Sorry? Are synthesized diamonds? They're the same, yes. They're identical. Yeah. Any other questions? I think there's, there's another one up here. Thank you. You said that uh, you thought diamonds might have gone through several cycles of uh, subduction. Mm. Uh, are, are there changes in the properties of of these diamonds dur during this subduction process in terms of impurities or uh, faults? Um, yes, I, I don't know how they get around the cycle. Um, it's only from the observation that they have um, cores which are very different to the rims of the diamonds. And so diamond often grows on a seed of pre-existing diamond. Um, and it's based on the model that, you know, if, if, if the carbon isotopes are telling us that they've been subducted, then we have such cores and possible rims which are not subducted. So that, that's all we know. I don't, it's not really proven they've gone around this cycle more than one time, but theoretically it's entirely possible. The, the oldest diamond we have uh, here is, I think, um, nearly 3 billion years old, uh, 2.9 billion years old. A lot of diamond is in the 2 to 3 billion year age range. Um, so there appears to be one event on the Earth which produced a lot of diamond in the mantle. Um, and uh, this particular diamond of 2.9 billion years is actually from a surface geological deposit that's 2.9 billion years old. So it was already at the surface and being weathered around by 2.9 billion years, so presumably a lot older as well. Brilliant. Well, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid, today. I'd like to thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you for your questions as well. Most importantly, if you could join me in thanking Dr. Adrian Jones. Thank you.